Ron Callis here with another episode of Automation Unplugged. Today is Wednesday, May 13th, uh, 2020. In case you're looking, you're listening to this at some future year, which would be pretty cool. And uh, excited to bring you another show. Uh, today is going to be episode 118, so 118. And uh, what's going on in One Firefly Land uh, before we get started? Um, you know, life is good. My family is still happy and healthy here dealing with the, the, the COVID-19 situation. Our team is still happy and healthy. And um, business is brisk. You know, what's super interesting with all these webinars uh, that we've been participating in and uh, additional shows. I was just talking to Eddie, our, our guest I'll bring on in a minute. And uh, we were just sharing that there's so much more content being put out there. And, uh, and that includes us. You know, we ramped up the automation on plug shows from one every week or two to uh, two to three a week. And uh, I think we have two shows coming out this week. But uh, the feedback's been been coming in. It's been very positive around uh, you guys valuing hearing from our guests and hearing their perspectives and how they're dealing with the situation out there. And uh, definitely keep the feedback coming. Uh, let us know you, you know your thoughts around uh, the topics and the discussions. And uh, as you have been doing, uh, definitely feel free to continue sharing that. I, I am going to jump over to Facebook here just to make sure that uh, the show looks like it's coming in live. Uh, so just bear with me as I refresh the Facebook page, and then we will uh, we'll bring in our guests. Okay. It looks like uh, technology is behaving. Fingers crossed, knocking on wood. And uh, I'm proud to, to bring you longtime friend. Uh, I've known this fella uh, since the, the origin, at least of, of my business, One Firefly, and the predecessor, Firefly Design Group. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll let him tell the story of how he, he, we ran into each other at Acedia uh, uh, years ago. Um, but I'm going to be bringing you uh, Eddie Shapiro of uh, Smart Touch USA. And uh, Eddie's running a, a great business out of the Mid-Atlantic region. And uh, he's also been doing a tremendous amount of volunteering for the industry, uh, both with CEDIA and the CTA. Uh, so happy to bring uh, Eddie in. Let me go ahead and, and click a few buttons here and see if I can bring him into the discussion. Eddie, how are you, sir? Good, good. How are you, Ron? Oh, it's just another day in paradise, man. It's cranking. <laughs> yes. Not, not sure what day it is. Uh, uh, life seems to be blending one day into the next. And, uh, you know, things are kind of topsy-turvy in terms of mornings and nights and weekends. But all is well. There's only three days in a week now. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I I love that. Is that <laughs> yours? Did you steal that from someone? Or is that? Uh, that's good, though. I like it's it. Been, it's been borrowed, for sure. Awesome. And we already got some folks uh, jumping in here. Hey, Ian. Thank you, buddy. Got Ian Williams uh, down there in, uh, you're in South Carolina, Ian, I believe. And uh, we got uh, Haggai coming to us from the Palm Desert. What's up, Haggai? <laughs> I was uh, I was just in a board call with Richard from Azion yesterday. And uh, Haggai, I heard that Access Networks is kicking Butte. So congratulations. I know that you guys are doing really well. Um, Eddie, for those that are uh, not familiar with you, wh where are you coming to us from? Where's your Where's your business based? So we're located in the Washington, D.C. area, Mid-Atlantic. So we operate in Virginia, Maryland, D.C. And uh, what is your business? How long have you been doing this? Kind of what's that, what's that backstory? So uh, I've been in the industry for over three decades. <laughs> and uh, been working in the luxury high-end space for a while in terms of AV technology. So we, we live in that space. So we're doing a lot of larger homes with lighting control, shades, Crestron technology, Savant technology, depending on the project. Got it. And how did you, I, I always, uh, I, uh, I, there's a consistent theme here that when I get started in an interview, I always love to learn the backstory. And that is how did you actually get into this business 30 years ago? And, and what does that progression look like for you? 
Do you mind sharing that? Oh, no, no. It's a, it's, it's definitely a timeline. So, uh, well, and I'm curious, wait, what were you doing 30 years ago? So what, what did home automation or home tech look like 30 years ago? So I actually started in security. So, um, I was old enough to drive. <laughs> okay. All right. That's good. And, uh, I was working doing electronic security only. So do you remember the silver tape that you used to put on windows for alarm systems? Silver you, tape. You no, but I, I remember when you used to have to run wires. I remember those days. Now everything's oh, yeah. batteries. Oh, yes. So you used to put this tape on the window and you'd stretch it. And then you'd, you'd slack it for better, the best word I could say. You'd put a coat over it. And if the window broke, the foil was stretched to the point where if it had any kind of crack in the window, it would break. And that break in the foil is how the alarm went off. So, <laughs> so long time ago, um, this is before there was even a processor for a security alarm. Um, but uh, I, I, I was in the industry when the processors came out. Uh, <laughs> wow. so, so I started there, worked for a company for about a year and a half. I actually started selling security for him. Um, and then he seemed rather annoyed to get calls. Well, how much is this and how much is that? And so people started saying, you know, why don't you come do my alarm system? So there was enough demand out there that I left. I did that. And I would say the pinnacle moment um, of moving into pure AV was many years ago when I did a large home. And I worked really hard on the security alarm. I went to show it to the customer, and he could have cared less. He was on the floor with his family looking at this huge, you know, Mitsubishi big screen TV. Everybody was thrilled with this TV. And I'm like, man, I am on the wrong end of this business. So that's when I flipped and never looked back. So security is, is certainly a part of what we do in a big way, but it's, not our primary business in any way. Do you, do you still sell monitored security services to your customers? Sure, sure. So along with the guys access network uh, Wi-Fi components, we're doing you know security, networking, lighting control, electronic shades, video distribution, multi-room audio, the typical flavor of products that everybody's installing. But we don't sub out our security. We do it directly. Well, a guy's giving you a very nice compliment. He's he <laughs> says you're clearly too young for silver tape. So uh, <laughs> this, this must have been a story from your grandfather, not not your story. Uh, I hear you. Thank you, Hagai. <laughs> that that is funny. So uh, we're obviously all dealing with this this C19 situation out there. Uh, are you guys opened back up, or what? What's kind of the state of the union right now? So our focus is. Um, residential construction. So we're, we're working on homes that are under construction. We're outside. We're very, very serious about COVID-19 and maintaining, you know, distancing and everybody's wearing a mask. Everybody has hand sanitizer. We've been working on that. We have one team member that goes out to people's homes. They must fill out a form. They must sign the form. They must sign a waiver. Um, so if we're going to go into your home, you agree that we are not responsible if you get sick. So if you want us, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll come, but we're trying to make sure that we protect ourselves liability wise and make sure that the customers who are really important to us and our teammates that are important to us are all protected. We'll, we'll give a homeowner a mask if they don't have one. Um, we asked that in the questionnaire, do you need one? We had one client say, sure, we could use about three or four. And it's like, well, no, 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 we're not a PPE supply <laughs> Distribution center. Distribution company. Right, right. We're not in, in that game, but we're happy to give you one. That's <laughs> so, funny. Where, where did you get this template for the waiver? Did Is that something that came from Cedia or is this something you drafted on your own? So it's been evolving over time. Um, so we work with One Vision. We're a One Vision company in terms of getting support from them because they do a great job. and. Um, there is one of the members of the group that actually had a template that he shared with everybody. I wish I remembered his name, but I don't. Um, but then over time, I began listening to what everybody else was doing. And like a liability issue is, is large. So I added that. Um, I actually went on to Ford Motor Company's website when Googling for COVID-19 documents. 
and found a few pieces of information there that I added to our latest uh, document. Our document's probably in its fourth or fifth revision. What led you to go to the Ford website to do this? That's such a peculiar <laughs> path of, of research. Well, I was Googling COVID-19 policies and procedures and they came up and I'm like, well, if Ford's doing it, it's got to be pretty, pretty well thought out, right? So um, there were a few little pieces there that were worth um, using. And I would say that if anybody wants the document, happy to share it. So happy to do that. That, but I that think would it's be important. awesome. Maybe uh, I'm just thinking we always do show notes on the, the page on the One Firefly site. So if you could maybe, Eddie, if you're willing, if you put that up on a Dropbox or somewhere, then we could link to that maybe on the show notes page. Sure. Uh, it's in PDF and pages, so we'll have to figure out how to get it into Word. <laughs> oh, no, no. If it's a PDF, um, yeah, we'll figure that out. I don't I'll know. figure if, it out. If, if you're offering to give it away I and or uh, hand that out to folks, then we'll, we'll find a good way to get that distributed. Sure. So... Um, one thing that I've been curious about uh, with all of my guests is what has business development looked like, i.e. the acquisition of new customers or new opportunities? What does that look like in April? And what is it looking right now that we're in mid-May? So acquisition for us looks like a lot of Zoom calls. Um, I said to somebody this morning that I should become CEO of Zoom. I've mastered it to its entirety. Um, so a You're lot a of Zoom, a Zoom ninja. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, we are uh, spending a lot of time on calls with clients, and it's actually a pretty smart approach. I mean, I would continue to do that after COVID in some regards. Um, there are people that want to get together for things that, quite frankly, would be smarter to save the 45-minute drive each way and whatever else and, and have that um, – meeting online. I, I'm a social person, so I think being in person has a lot of value, but I could see a little bit of a mix there. Yeah. I mean, I, I, as I've shared with folks a number on a number of occasions during these shows, particularly over the last few months, when Firefly transitioned to being remote or working out of home offices back in 2015. And I mean, if you talk about productivity, just in terms of talking about talking to both prospects and customers. I mean, I, I can interact with exponentially more people in this format than, than in person. So there's value, like you said, in person, nothing replaces that FaceTime, you know, being in the same time and space as the other party. But uh, with modern technology, especially if you want to share plans or do work of maybe I can imagine you might want to drop icons on a set of plans, like speakers here, touch panels here. It's pretty cool to be able to use all your tech at your disposal to have those meetings. We've had a number of meetings where we are going over drawings, going over lighting design, spending time with lighting designers and the client and the builder at the same time. And it works out really well. I like it. I think it's a uh, rather constructive. Yeah. So, Do you think this change, like look forward, you look into the future, step maybe three to five years into the future. What does uh, it look like for our industry? Well, first, I think video is important. Um, even if you're, I know that Ian used to have company meetings by phone. I don't know a platform he used video, video calls once a week. And I, I think getting in front of your techs who are remote a lot of the times once a week is super important. Um, in terms of the three to five year outlook, I, I hope we're all back together, but I think it's going to be a good mix of still doing a lot of drawings by, by Zoom or whatever. I think it's a good place to be reviewing drawings. What, what is the, the mix of your work, Eddie, in terms of residential versus commercial projects? So historically, historically, it's always been high end residential luxury product. You know, it's very little, we, we do, we do. A fair amount of commercial boardrooms per year, and we love it. It's a great segment, but our our expertise is in high end, large residential. What, if any, changes are you seeing, either in what you're excited to talk about, or what the consumer is excited to learn about in terms of technologies? You know, I'm just saying, given that we've all 
spent a lot more time together in our in our homes. Is there any change? I I don't see the change yet, but I envision that the change will be that media spaces and um, theater spaces will come back. They'll be larger than life in terms of what people want now in their homes. Before theaters were certainly uh, shrinking in terms of market use, case use, but I think that you're going to see some uh, increase in that. I also think that you're going to see an increase in uh, security, cameras, security in general, because, and, and this isn't me talking, I actually heard uh, a CDA podcast last week from the Tech Council that covered uh, security in the UK a little bit as part of the overall conversation. And as the economy dives deeply, which it will for a while, the rise of crime will increase as we start to leave our homes. Um, it's not exactly an exciting topic, um, but with but it that, it seems said, reasonable. I mean, if right. you have such a large percentage of the population unemployed, you know, I'm just going to say, looking from a, a security and safety standpoint, I can tell you at my house, uh, one of the first pieces of tech we put in was, uh, in our case, we did a, a Vivint uh, uh, security <laughs> system. But we ended up putting their 4K HD cameras around the perimeter of the house. And I, I, I don't know if it's real security or it just makes you feel secure. But I know in our home, my, my wife loves the idea that she can go to her phone and see, you know, high def video, you know, from all corners of the home around the perimeter of the house. It just makes you feel good. Sure. And I think cameras are cameras are for archiving history. So they're not really immediate security unless somebody Unless they, they scare the bad guy away because they right. see the camera. Unless someone's astute enough to notice the camera. Right. It, but it does have value. You want to be able to find out who did what, where, and when. And a camera will do that. So I I I haven't seen a project that is void of cameras in a while. Most of our projects have cameras. That makes sense. So you, you mentioned just a moment ago the Cedia Tech council podcast i know that you are i actually need to look over here at my notes here but i know you're involved with the cedia tech council do you mind sharing kind of in what capacity that what is the cedia tech council if folks are listening and aren't aware of that you know i know that cedia is always on a, a voyage of making sure or trying to help the industry understand what they're doing and how they're in fact trying to make our industry better and i know that the tech council is one of those efforts Right. So, sure, sure. So, CEDIA overall does a lot to encourage people to volunteer. And I would say that it's been one of the best things I've done. Um, and uh, in doing so, I'm on the Tech Council because I volunteered for it. And the Tech Council works on writing white papers for our industry. They also do podcasts. And every week there is a podcast covering all kinds of topics. And I would encourage everybody to listen to them because right now, especially, they're doing more of them. And um, like Automation Unplugged, they're very informative. So it's it's solid. Uh, we, we work on trying to figure out what's happening in the future. A lot of people probably know who Rich Green is. Uh, he's always talking about the future. So along with Rich, we work on trying to figure out what the tech trends will be coming down the road. We're already looking at what's happening in 2025, as an example. So a lot of work is done in that area. We also do some classes. Uh, Rich and Peter A. Lett and those guys are very involved in classes. I've been involved in some as, as a co-teacher. So that part's very good. But it's highly rewarding. I've met a lot of really great people, smarter than me, that do some amazing things. If folks are listening that would uh, like to find out about the volunteer opportunities with CDO, what's the, the path to navigate there? Uh, I would start by going to the CDO website. Um, if they need to uh, find another avenue because that's not clear enough, they can always email me and I'll put them in touch with the right people just because I don't know those links right now. Sure. Yeah, no worries. We can put them in the show notes. Um and uh, Ian was uh, checking out the show and then he just posted. He said he's got, uh, he says, Eddie, I got to run, but let's catch up soon. Stay safe. 
So I just wanted to. Uh, he also to, says, I know a theater guy. <laughs> he does say that. He does say he knows a theater guy. That's, yes, he does. <laughs> that's, that's funny. Uh, in terms of the Tech Council podcast, what type of content's covered on that show? So uh, Leslie Shiner, if anybody has not heard of her, she's amazing. She handles and talks about finance all the time, QuickBooks, how to run your business. She's a no-nonsense, to-the-point, practical person talking about processes. And you should go back to her podcast. She was on about maybe two or three weeks ago. Uh, she's a great resource for our industry. She is a CDO fellow, um, which means that she's volunteered for a long time and offered a lot to CDO. Um, she's fantastic. Um, and along those lines, talking about that and talking about COVID, um, you know, Leslie would tell you to go out and get the cash that is on your books. So if you're working for builders and you're working for clients, you got to stay ahead of the cash right now. Cash is king. In terms of the Tech Council, just so that I'm clear, the Tech Council podcast is covering more than just tech or technology. I was making an assumption it was just going to be technologies, but you're saying it it goes broader into operations and finance and all well, that. Well, they stuff. have different they have different people on. You know, John Penny, who's worked at 20th Century Fox, has been on. He's a friend of Cedia. Uh, you have people like Peter Aylett and Rich Green and Christian Bukes that are on. As a matter of fact, they were on this last podcast, which was yesterday. Um, they tend to talk this week. They're talking about, C you know, COVID and, and the world pandemic. And I haven't listened to yesterday's yet, but I read the notes. Um, uh, Peter Aylett is an amazing audio guy. He talks about theater spaces and audio and designs audio, you know, components for for space in terms of, you know, acoustic issues and does a complete design. So he's a great guy. Um, they're talking about video. They're talking about um, uh, Delos was on talking about wellness. I mean, anything that you can think of that impacts our industry, um, whether it's looking into the future of what's next or how we're going to be impacted now by COVID or, you know, just how to survive right now because of COVID. Those guys are talking about it. So very wide range of, of discussions. What, do you mind sharing for your, your own business? What, what impact on the year do you think this is going to have for, for your business? So I would say that right now we are doing fine. You know, are we setting the world on fire? No. Are we in trouble? No, not by any stretch. We probably have enough business for the year or close to it. Um, but my concern is what does next year look like? And what does 2022 look like? Um, maybe what does December look like? So um, if we go back up in terms of people who are infected and people who are getting sick and dying, um, things could tighten up and shut down again. So, and they could shut down harder than ever. So we just don't know as companies what the next steps are and how they're going to impact our companies. So I think our industry is very lucky that in most states, we can still do new construction work. Um, there are people that are just wiped out in terms of finance and their businesses. Small business in this country is going to change. And anybody who thinks that the new normal when we come out of this looks like the old normal is definitely delusional. And I use that word just like Steve Moore did a few days ago on the CDA podcast, because he's right. What, what, yeah, so the concept there is pivot or die. Right? Absolutely. You, you, you have to, you have to change the way you're handling your accounting in terms of, like I said, a few minutes ago, don't be shy to go to your customers who are behind on their payments and see if you can get paid. Um, I've heard some people say, you know, collect a larger deposit and maybe give them a slight discount. There are all kinds of ways to, to handle money and, and handle you know, the financial aspect of this. But um, certainly pivoting is going to be important. Um, maybe whatever we all do next year looks different than what we're doing now. Maybe we won't be doing lighting and shading and, and video distribution next year, but we'll be doing more security access control and, and cameras and network security and anything more related to 
you know, keeping the home environment secure and connected. Anything that you're doing in terms of the way you're having conversations with prospects or maybe in the way in terms of you're doing your marketing or maybe in the terms of the people that you're networking with to try well, to position yourself to handle that unknown future? So there's this guy that works at one one firefly named Josh, and I'm working with him on a few few things, maybe increasing our our blog, maybe doing a few other things to our website, um, also working on some savant programs with him. So marketing all the time is really important, even in bad times, because you want to be positioned for when things get better that your name is out there. I'm also a CDA outreach instructor, so trying to work with um, different firms that need CEUs, of which you can now do remotely via Zoom and other platforms. So trying to get more exposure with the architects and the interior designers uh, so that we can stay in front of them. You know, now's not the time to retreat in any way. Eddie, I know that you have been doing some uh, very interesting stuff in terms of the collaboration between CES and the CTA and CEDIA in particular around standards. Can you, you know, fill us in on, on what you're doing there and, and what you've been working on? So I would say it's more about the group than it is me. Um, I, I chair one of the groups, but um, I am not the subject matter expert by any stretch. So you have guys like Joel Silver, and some guys from Harman, and again, Peter Aylett is very involved, Rich Green's involved, um, Walt Zerby's involved from CEDIA, um, Leslie King from CTA, all really good, smart people, deeply involved in helping with standards to work on home theater. So in terms of home theater design, they're working on some standards, you know, I'll dumb it down just to keep it simple, a good, better, best scenario that's a standard so that um, industry folks can build a home theater to one of those standards. And as long as they meet X number of criteria, they'll have, you know, a standardized room in terms of, of specification and testing that will make that room excellent. And so obviously a $500,000 home theater probably will land at a different level than a $90,000 home theater, but both are home theaters. So I, I think they're really trying to clarify that and help to guide the industry in, on how to, to deliver that. And uh, that's obviously in a, in a video scenario and an audio scenario. So there's some work being done there too. Does it, does it go or will it go beyond uh, just home theater? In terms uh, of the standards effort, I mean, is there's that also an audio standard. So, for example, what does what does surround sound look like? What is you know five point one? What is what does Dolby Atmos look like? Um, I'm not the best person to talk about that standard, but they certainly are doing that. Uh, there's been conversations of you know how does how does a room with a sound bar fall into that as opposed to the typical way you would do home theater with speakers and, you know, maybe acoustically transparent screens for your, your theater part of that. So I'm probably speaking a little bit out of turn, but there's a lot of work being done there. And I think it's good work. It's really good work. And it's one of those things that as a volunteer, if you didn't volunteer, you'd never know about it. How, how does it, let's say it's done and the standard is created. What's the distribution mechanism for that knowledge in that, that information? Well, in some cases, things are done with white papers. In this case, um, I would have to check with, with the team to figure out what that distribution is. But I, I know that there there is a, a plan for it. And some of these things are almost finished. And it's going to be pretty exciting. No, that's that's very interesting. Uh, a couple of, of you know, uh, conversations coming at you from left field here. One is we have CDA. Uh, still undefined as to whether the show, the expo is going to happen in September. And so you are, you're volunteering with the tech council. So you, you know, some people. So what do you know that just between us friends 
uh, that you can or are willing to share in terms of is is an is the expo meaning at the convention center is there going to be an event next September next September. Mm, well, you've asked the wrong guy. <laughs> Do you have an opinion whether it should or shouldn't happen? I, I have opinions and thoughts, but but you know, keep in mind that Cedia Expo isn't owned by Cedia anymore. Correct. So Emerald uh, will have to make that decision along with, I guess, Cedia. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I've been invited to speak at an event in Vegas at the end of September. Uh, I'm currently committed to speak. Uh, I don't know that I'll go yet. It really, as I said, we'll have to see what happens with the COVID cloud. Uh, if the cloud clears, then then there's a lot of possibility there. What, what I, would the COVID cloud clearing mean? COVID cloud means clearing means that we can fly on planes with with some intelligence. Um, we can be in social settings with some intelligence and 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 safety. I mean, it's all about safety. I'm not willing to go look at speakers and flat screens and go to classes um, if that means that I'm going to be sick and 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 my life threatened by going to an event. So um, I, again, we take it. Some people don't think COVID exists. Other people take it really seriously. Uh, I think the numbers speak for themselves. It exists. Um, and so I would love to go there. It's one of my favorite things to do, especially Denver. Although I did love watching you use your your scooter in the San Diego Convention Center. That was that not to be missed moment. Get, get, getting chased by the security guards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that was a great moment in time. <laughs> yeah, well, it was. Uh, I I had to get the classes across the convention center, and my back had gone gone out on me, and so that it was. Uh, zip through on a scooter or not make my classes. That's a ridiculous place to have classes. It's just mammoth. But but yeah, so I, I think that that everybody would love to be there, especially since we've all been cooped up in our houses for, for months. Um, but if it's not safe, then I don't think it's going to happen. Um, you know, so I, I, I can't look into the future, but I suspect I went to ISE in Amsterdam in February um so that was mid-february and looking back now that was a crazy thing to do mm -hmm. i mean you know the chinese had already been um omitted from the show if you will uh, <laughs> uh although there were still plenty news of, was breaking i mean even the days before the show there were vendors pulling out or yes it, it was not in hindsight the best move on my part um or many other people's part but that is an eighty thousand person show that ended up being a 50,000 person show. And so that's a big haircut. And if Cedia Expo is a 20,000 person show, give or take, um, it's likely to be a 10,000 person show when this is all over or less. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I mean, I, I'm a smaller vendor that would be at the show and, and I've put my deposit down and I, I know they're asking for vendors to put additional they, they moved the date from may to june for additional funds and it's like a it feels like a game of chicken and egg in terms of do you pay it and then let them cancel it and therefore by contract you get your money back or do you not pay it because you don't plan to go and by contract you don't get your initial deposit back and I, again, I'm a small vendor. There are vendors that spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, not only on show expenses, but their booths. I mean, millions of dollars. Right, millions. And it's, I mean, how do you play that game? I don't know. It's There just seems to be a lot of unknowns. I was excited to hear that Crestron's coming back to Cedia. I'm just not excited to hear that they're coming to the expo this year. <laughs> so... Um, I, I it's funny. I had John Clancy on this show uh, a, a week ago or a, a two weeks ago, and uh, we didn't talk about that. I didn't want to. I knew that he was considering it, uh, and I didn't want to put him on the spot, and and I didn't want to have it get recorded into posterity. His call. Uh, I didn't want to. Th this show. There's there's hopefully never any gotcha questions. I try not to to be that type of show. Good. <laughs> um, yeah. So I'm I'm not gonna give you any 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 hard ones, but. You know, I, I do wonder whether they made that announcement to get the benefit of the PR noise 
and they're clearly as bet they've gotten a tremendous amount of press, which is a really cool marketing move. And do they know that the show is not happening or do they really sincerely believe the show is going to happen or is Emerald using that announcement to try to spur other vendors to try to play ball and to sign on? Oh, there's so many things that could have happened. So there. It's, it's so complex. Like what, right. what exactly was the play there? Right. I'd like to know. I'd love to be the fly on the wall for that. But her guy, her guy is making some points here in, in the uh, chat session. Uh, oh yeah, let me put that on the screen. A guy access networks. He's saying, "I don't know how Cedia happens this year, and uh, Emerald needs to step up and cancel for everyone's safety." Uh, I, I'm gonna go on record, and I, I will do this. A guy, I agree with you. I, do I don't. I, I don't know how I tell my staff to go to the show, and I mean, how do I do that and put their lives, I mean, potentially at risk of getting sick? I mean, there's that. And then there's how many members of our industry are going to, let's say they've gone through this war or a number of battles and let's hope and pray Q3 and Q4 maybe pick up for many. How do they now pull out of those projects and, and justify sending themselves or their teams to a show? It, I, it's, I don't see it's, how that happened. It's not, it's illogical. Right. It doesn't make sense. There's first of all, many people aren't going because now their business has been impacted detrimentally to the point where they're just not going to get on a plane, even if it were safe. They don't have the time or the money. Um, and other people aren't going to go because we're not convinced it's safe. And so if the Democratic and the national conventions are threatened in August uh, as to whether they actually still happen, how do you, how do you have a session in, in September for CEDIA that's only a few weeks later I mean, who's confident that that's good? So I agree with the guy. It, it has to it has to be postponed or canceled. Yeah, I mean, my my assumption is there's a game of Emerald. I mean, Emerald's a trade show business, and uh, amongst other things. But I, I would imagine they have insurance, and it's and it's a game of well, then when does their insurance kick in? I mean, I'm hypothesizing. I don't know any of this. And so I, I would imagine when they've met certain triggers in their insurance policy, they're going to be able to formally announce cancellations. But they have, I mean, again, CD is one of many shows they put on. Oh so, yeah, Emerald's huge. I mean, they're they're going to get they're uh, they're going to be, I would imagine, acting upon many many insurance policies for many shows. Um, and so I think there's just a lot more to the story that we're, we're not in the loop on. We're not the fly on the wall where these things. Are <laughs> well, I, I would say that probably one of the hardest hit businesses this year will be emeralds. There's no question about it. Yeah. I, I mean, as we said, you know, pivot or die. I think that there are certainly industries. I mean, think of the restaurant industry, the travel industry, um, amongst many, many others that are just absolutely fundamentally changed, maybe changed forever. Yes. And, I mean, will trade shows be the thing in the future? Uh, I'll say something else controversial, perhaps buying groups, buying groups have meetings and you get together and you share and you learn from each other. I mean, when is that going to be politically correct again to do that? Just, I mean, let's say that it, based on a lot of the scientists, COVID takes years to develop a vaccine, right? So if there's no vaccine, how do you agree to get together and shake hands and be in the same time and space as everyone? I, I, I think I think an ASEAN meeting or a pro source meeting or even dealer conferences with manufacturers, as long as they're not hardware based and they're they're like we're talking, we're having dialogue. Um, if you can carve out the time with some discipline, you could probably be fairly successful with these events online for a little while. For, yeah, I, I think that virtual is a necessity, um, you know, and, and I've been in groups now for a, a while as a company, as a vendor, and I, I love them. We love being in groups. Uh, we love the meetings. But if there are no meetings, it changes the equation. And so wow. it's, it's, it's just one of many, many examples as, as an industry, how we have to figure this out. And right. I've been at Savant meetings for a number of years that were great dealer meetings and Crestron meetings that were great dealer meetings. And you learn a lot from 
the guy that's 3,000 miles away from you on the other side of the country who just wants to tell you everything about your business and and you want to hear it because it's interesting. Um, and you just don't get that same level of trust and eye contact and interaction that you know you would get if it were one-on-one -on -one in front of each other. But like everything else, like wearing a mask, you, you're going to have to get used to it for a little while. Yeah. I mean, you think about going and doing that and then you think about, and let's say we're warriors, we'll go do that, but it's not about us. It's who do you then come back to and put at risk? Right. And just, right. it's, it's very interesting and stressful and complex because it's so game shit. I mean, it's so we have to shift our thinking and the way we approach these things. Uh, I, I think it's definitely going to be interesting. Um, what is your opinion? Uh, kind of another sideways question. John Clancy has been running Crestron now the residential piece globally for, uh, I think he's joined it four years ago, four or five years ago. Um, I know you're a big Crestron guy. How, how are things going in Crestron land? Um, well, I think pretty awesomely. <laughs> so, okay. um, the horizon lighting keypads, uh, the whole Horizon line, now the new uh, Infinite EX wireless keypads, I think are probably some of the best looking lighting keypads in the market. Um, John has been absolutely a game changer for Crashdron. Uh, Doug is amazing as well. Those two guys are doing immense work in the residential side. A lot of people criticize Crestron for not being truly in the residential market. I have to say that that is the furthest thing from the truth. John Clancy has has re re invigorized, if that's the word. <laughs> totally. It's a word now. It's an Eddie word. word. Now. It's a Shapiroism. Now. Yes, <laughs> he, he has put a lot of energy back into this this whole division, and Crestron Residential, I think, is on fire, doing amazing things. Uh, Crestron Home. That's the new uh, UI, the new uh, operating yes. system. What, yes. what do you? Is, is it, is it Ping 2.0 or is it is it uh, something reborn? Is it where it needs to be? What's your read on that? You have any other questions? Uh, no, man. <laughs> I, 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 we're, we're all about so, honest. Is that a gotcha question? I didn't. No, know. no, no, no. So my feeling is different than probably you know. If you put three integrators in the room and ask them an opinion, you'll get six. So oh, and just for clarity, for those that don't know, Crestron was born and bred with a custom UI and custom coding. And uh, frankly, residentially, because I was there at Crestron when this happened, that's when Savant and Control4 and Elon and others started really giving Crestron a run for the money is because they designed a smaller sandbox that probably did most of what the integrator would need to provide to a homeowner. And Crestron for the longest time operated in a domain where everything could do everything. And thus it was more complex and would cost more for programming and, and whatnot. Right. The, the adage is the great thing about Crestron is it can do anything you want. The bad thing about Crestron is it can do everything you want. That's and, right. and there are really good Crestron integrators and implementers out there as, as there are in, in any of the control platforms. And there's some really bad ones. I mean, I've seen badly programmed Savant. So there, there's a spectrum and I can say it as a rep. I was a Lutron rep and then a Crestron rep. There are, uh, there's a spectrum. Uh, I don't care what brand you sell in every market. There's a spectrum of quality of, it, of business operator, which yeah. just so happens in our universe, we call them integrators. And these business operators, there's people that are on the, 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 the high end of the scale. Quality matters. Excellence matters across everything they do, including their deployments and the way they treat their team and their customers. And then there's terrible businesses and yeah. there's a full spectrum. And so it's, <laughs> I, I would not pick on Crestron or any brand for that. Right. Um, I mean, that was so, my observation. Right. So what, what, what happened or is happening or still happening is if you use Crestron to its fullest capabilities, writing in a program called simple, you can create great UIs, you know, they're custom. Every one of them is custom. And if you're a really good high-end AV company, you're delivering a very good UI that works. Um, the problem that Crestron had was that a lot of these dealers or some dealers were not delivering good product. That damages a brand. The reason that Control4 and Savant 
do well and have good reputations, and I think both have good product, is because that it's hard to make a mistake and go off course. So um, Crestron did what they should have done. It's it's a great opportunity to take a really good solid hardware platform and software platform and make it static like the other platforms from the other companies and make it so right you're in a sandbox you're delivering a product that looks good um is slick looking it's intuitive um and it's repeatable in our business if you're not using the same product all the time and repeating the success that you had from the last project then you're probably having a lot of issues so if you're that kind of company that is always out there trying the latest and greatest product and you're using Elan one year and Control 4 the next and Savant the next and Crestron the next, or always trying new widgets and third-party add-ons, you're probably in a painful place. But if you're using the same product over and over again because it has success for you and your homeowners, which is the most important person to worry about, is the client, then, then you're doing well. So putting you in this sandbox of Crestron Home 3.0 is a really great thing for a lot of companies. So the reason I said, did you have another question is because um, it still has a few limitations. It is really good. I really like it. I would say by September, it will be a product that has no limitations. They are working hard. I know that John Clancy has put his heart and soul into this for at least two and a half years. He is not going to let it be a failure. And it is far from a failure. It is doing really well. Yeah, I, I know it's. Uh, I've I've heard whispers that. Uh, actually, you know what? I I can say this. This isn't a whisper. Um, when Firefly, we have our UI University, our video tutorial product, and for we've had that out since 2016, and our clients have, um, you know, so we have Savant UIs and C4 and Sonos and mm -hmm. Alarm.com. And uh, we have not had Crestron. Notably, we have not had Crestron. Can you I noticed. Ask why? Can you ask? Can you wonder why we have not had Crestron? Yes, of course. It's impossible. It's impossible. It's because right. every dealer is doing something different. It was. It was not not possible. But now with Crestron Home, it's possible. Yes, looking forward to that. So we're we're actually in production right now. And we're, we are, full disclosure, working with uh, Crestron to get that captured and shot. And uh, I know there are software updates coming later this summer that we're actually making sure are in what we're capturing now. So if you're out there listening or watching, stay tuned. There'll be announcements. But I've already tipped my hand here. But the, we, we've got some cool Crestron stuff. I'm, I'm excited for it. I, I think that the UI University is great. And I think that the UI from Crestron with Crestron Home 3.0 is absolutely a game changer for anybody doing Crestron and probably for most residential clients. It's, it's, it's a superior product. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know if this, you perceive this as a good thing or bad thing, Eddie, but I'll just tell you this, an observation from where I sit is that often in downturns, businesses downsize and in downsizing, it feels painful, but a lot of those folks, some of those folks go and start, ultimately start new businesses. And those new businesses, in many cases, will discover, as an example, Crestron, and all they'll ever know is Crestron Home. Right. All they'll ever know is that sandbox. And so there's legacy history that moves through a market of what was. And I know John and Crestron are fighting that because what the market has known is custom. Full anything can do anything. But there'll be a day where I'm imagining, if they stick with it, which I'm optimistic they will, that this thing will gain traction. That's my guess. Right. No, it will. And Crestron Home isn't going anywhere. It's going to get bigger and bigger. And for the smaller integrator, it's it's the smartest avenue you can take. I mean, we we do our own programming and we do it well. And but it's not for everybody. And we didn't always have the best programmers. We have extremely good programmers now. So it just goes to show you that that again, it relies on on your team. Team is everything for this. And but but OS Home 3.0 from Crestron will make it so good, solid integrators can deliver really nice products.
And so I, I, I had teased Eddie, uh, just looking at the clock we're, 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 we're going on, uh, almost an hour here. I want to say, um, I teased in the opening that I was going to have you say to the audience, how you first met me or what that first interaction was. And I, I, I think it was at CDF, but I might be misremembering. Do you, do you, yeah. you want to share that? Sure. Sure. It was back around 2007 or eight, um, at CDF in Denver my favorite venue for Cedia. Mine as well. And uh, you were running around the convention floor uh, with a backpack and that was your office. <laughs> and, and we basically found a place to sit down and you went over all the things that Firefly does or did at the time. And that's how we met. And uh, that's, listen, I remember when Snap AV was across the street in a, in a mobile trailer and that was their booth in 2005, six or seven. And, you know, look at that company today, look at one Firefly, a vastly different company today than, than when I met you all those years ago. So. No, that's, great. that is so true. P pivot or die, my friends. Listen, exactly. I, I, I remember my, my little business was born in the last great recession. And uh, to say it was the school of hard knocks is putting it lightly. And uh, I'm I'm happy to say many of those lessons I learned dealing with that have aided us this time around, and and the business is uh, actually doing quite well right now, and uh, we're able to help lots of people, which is uh, definitely puts a smile on my face and puts a smile on the face of my team. Um, Eddie, uh, I would close with this. Uh, actually, I'm going to close with two things. I'm going to ask you a question, and then I'm going to ask you how people should contact you if they want to get in touch. Um, the, the closing question is, uh, what word of advice do you have for business operators or people within integration firms that are listening? You've, you've been at this, as you said, for three decades, starting in the days of silver tape and yes. uh, bringing us to Crestron Home here in the present. Um, what uh, parting words or advice do you have for those that might be challenged or struggling right now dealing with you know this, this economy and, and running a business? Well, for, for general businesses, I would go back to the conversation about money. You've got to get on top of the money. So whoever owes your money, collect the money in a nice way, of course, but it's time to collect your cash. You'll need it. Um, for AV integrators, I would focus hard on service and support. Clients want really good support. They're demanding good support. They're willing to pay for good support. So it's not about slamming a system in and walking away. I've seen too many of those. Uh, it's all about support, or as they say in the UK, aftercare. So aftercare, is that how it's branded in the UK? Yes. Aftercare. I love it. And, and today do, do, do the majority of your customers, are they on some sort of, uh, aftercare contract? Uh, some are, some are not. Um, we've actually spent the last, I'd say, COVID month, <laughs> that's different than a normal month. Um, actually, in a lot of training sessions with One Vision, uh, getting our entire team up to speed to make sure that we can deliver at a level that meets everybody's bar for really good support. And it's a great time to focus on your support. I don't care how you deliver support in terms of whether you join Parasol or One Vision or have a different plan in place. But I would tell you that that it's hard to do it alone. So joining One Vision, um, as an example, will give you a lot of processes that you wouldn't even think of. Gives you a lot of discipline. So Joey and his team, Alex, Julia, all those guys are just really hitting it out of the park. Yeah, they are a first class operation. And uh, I know often when I'll, I just simply want to brainstorm something going on in the industry, I'll give Joey a call. He's a, he's really a gem in terms of a strategic thinker. And yes, uh, exactly. I know he keeps me on my toes through any conversation. So if I'm looking for that, then I'm, I'm giving him a call. And he, yeah. he also hires amazing people. So no, uh, some of his, some of his team are amazing. Jason also, don't want to forget about you, Jason. And, and Alex is outstanding, just absolutely an amazing trainer. So a really good group of people, very thoughtful, very smart. They're headed in the right direction. Agreed. 
Uh, Eddie, how can folks uh, that are listening to this or watching this and they want to get in touch with you directly or follow your business, what are the best ways to do that? So they could email me at eddie, E-D-D-I-E, at smarttouchusa.com. And Smart Touch has two Ts, of course. All right. I'm going to attempt to put that onto a scroller here. So I'm going to do that one more time. Eddie at smart touch touch with two USA. USA. Dot com. Com. yes all right let's see if i did that right here let me Does that look right looks good all right well eddie it has uh it has been a pleasure to have you on uh episode 118 of automation unplugged thanks for coming on and doing this thank you ron really appreciate it great to be here today awesome thank you eddie All right, gang. Well, there you have it. Uh, The one and only Eddie Shapiro, uh, really an industry veteran. And what I think makes him even more special is his willingness to contribute and give back to the industry through volunteering time, both to the CTA and to Cedia. And uh, I know when I'm when I'm brainstorming things here at One Firefly, uh, regardless of whether he plans to buy or consume said product or service, I can count on always bringing it to Eddie and he'll give me good feedback. And uh, that's really priceless as we're, we're growing a company. And uh, it's important to have those people in your orbit uh, that can really give you critical thinking. And they're, they're not yes people. Eddie's not a yes person. Uh, he, has, he has no problem to tell me what seems right and maybe what seems off and uh, really value that. So uh, thanks, Eddie, for coming on the show. And uh, thank you. Uh, for uh, everyone watching and listening. And uh, if you have not already done so, uh, please subscribe. Uh, Again, that's just a great way to consume the show. If you haven't already done so, uh, share it with your friends. I had a neat story. Uh, I met some folks from Italy and England recently, and and they were just thinking about starting their business. And I actually pointed them over to, to... my podcast as well as some other industry podcasts. And I actually got an email back uh, Friday last week. And uh, they they said they've been consuming the show, listening to all the integrators and the guests and manufacturers and folks. And they found the the show tremendously important and uh, valuable. And that's really why we create this. That's why I I put these shows together. And I have an awesome team behind me. Uh, most importantly, Stephanie and Allison that help uh, get these shows, all the artwork, all the scheduling, all the podcast management. I, I have the easy part. I just have to show up and talk into the microphone and interact with my guests. But really, my team is the one carrying all the weight. Uh, so they are the folks that make things happen. So uh, special thanks to my team behind the scenes. And uh, on that note, gang, I'm going to sign off. I will, I think we're doing another show this week. Stay tuned to our Facebook page. Uh, I, you know what? I think I know this. Correct me, uh, team, if I'm wrong. Uh, But I I think I know that it's Matt DeVance over at DeVance in Dallas. So if you guys want to check that out, stay tuned later this week. And on that note, be well, uh, stay strong, wash your hands, hug those around you, and uh, we'll see you next time.